welcome to Crime in Court. This is day 15 of the trial of Richard Allen. We're going to go over some testimony recaps, some of the highlights that happened in court. I'm going to read through a couple different uh, perspectives from some of the reporters that were there on the scene, uh, lo local reporters. So, um, They've done a really good job, and I'm going to stick with Max Lewis and um, Wish TV because they do a really good job at giving us the detailed information. So I'm going to stick with them today. I like to switch it up and give you guys different people's accounts, but these are really, these guys I've been reusing. Just if you've been watching my videos and recaps, you'll know. All right, so Delphi... Day 15 of trial, which was actually Monday, November 4th, 2024, is day 15 of trial. And Max Lewis, of he's an anchor and reporter of Fox 59 and CBS 4 Indy. He says, we began this morning with Dr. Polly Westcott, who is a specialist in forensic psychology. She is paid by the defense and was asked by them in May 2023 to evaluate Richard Allen. She did so by reviewing his medical records as well as the video of him in prison, from prison, and she was sent, oh sorry, she went to Westville Correctional Facility also to evaluate him. So she, um, she received medical records and video of him and she also went to evaluate him. Her in-person exam took place August 2023. By that time, he had already been in prison for almost a year in solitary confinement because he was arrested in October of 2022. In Dr. Westcott's report, she writes that she found Alan had an intense mental health history. She said that he was closed off as a child and began anxiety meds in his 20s. He has struggled with, at times, severe depression throughout his life. She diagnosed him with dependent, pers dis a dependent personality disorder. I've never heard of that one before. But this means that he needs other people to feel like a whole person. Like he needs, he relies on, uh, he relies on people for support in his life. The doctor said Alan relies heavily on his wife and his mother. She described him as a fragile egg when he, re when he arrived at prison after the arrest. So he was already fragile when he arrived after the arrest. So it didn't take much to crack him. According, you know, that, that's my, <laughs> I added that part. Um, I think they, it didn't take much to crack him to make him supposedly confessed 60 so times, 60 or so times, which I, most of those confessions weren't quite confessions in my mind. But All right, so Dr. Westcott said that she ruled out the possibility that he was faking his symptoms through several widely accepted objective tests. So it didn't have anything to do with her subjective perception of how Richard Allen was behaving. It was based on widely accepted objective tests. That's really key. She described a clear decline in his mental and physical health while in prison. She also did a handwriting comparison of Mr. Allen, which she says even further shows his mental health decline. She said his writing can show, or a some a person's writing can show their thought process. She says the confession statement is disorganized and lacks grammar. So remember in this confession statement that they recreated because you're not allowed to take pictures of any of the evidence or have any of it in your possession apparently, but this is the form that the report, the local reporters recreated to show what the public, what his handwriting was like. So as you can see, it says, I am ready to officially confess for K-I double L-ing Abby and Libby. Like it's just written 
very uh, like all fragmented. This four should be down here. You know, it's just really odd. And then on the side, he says, I hope I get the opportunity to tell the families I'm sorry. So she says, his confession statement is disorganized and lacks grammar and punctuation. Also said that the thoughts are fragmented and altogether are a sign of psychosis, which we, you know, we evaluated this before and I said similarly, like, look how he writes and, and, and in the way that it's written, like it doesn't, if you read it grammatically, I am ready to officially for confess K.I. double Elling, Abby and Libby. It's just weird. All right. So Dr. Westcott found that Alan is passive avoids conflict, and has a strong fear of abandonment. She also testified that he is not very resilient and much more likely to decompensate under a stressful situation. She said stressors on top of severe depression can lead to psychosis, which I don't know about you, but one of the more stressful things probably would be to be arrested and being accused of a crime you didn't do that would probably be very stressful and uh, on top of his severe depression it can lead to psychosis which she in her opinion believes it did in this case she said dr walla's medical notes we all remember dr walla she's a little fame seeking w-h-o-r-e and um she is the she was the doctor that treated Richard Allen while he was in prison, but she was also in many, 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 many Facebook and other social media groups that talked about this case. She discussed this case on social media as she was the treating, supposedly treating psychiatrist uh, for Richard Allen. I believe she also knew about the case and sought out or at least volunteered to take over this case or to be the one to go and if, be assigned to evaluate him. And uh, she, she's got some problems with her testimony. She's got problems with her credibility. So um, Dr. Westcott is saying Dr. Wallace medical notes and all medical notes are done through the provider's eyes. She seems to indicate that Richard Allen's detailed confession wouldn't have been relayed in a narrative fashion as Dr. Walla put it in her report. So she wrote it all as like this big narrative, almost like a defendant or a suspect would if they were in a, uh, in a room with a cop and the cop says, write down your confession. So you write a statement. That's how it was written. But Dr. Walla wrote it as if Richard Allen was writing it or saying it. But Dr. Westcott believes that it wouldn't have happened in a narrative fashion as Dr. Walla, Walla put it in her report. So that means potentially Dr. Walla fabricated and made some things up. I don't know. We put, put her own spin on things. We have no idea. So this narrative should have never come in or at least needs to be really heavily scrutinized because of that and we can't do much of that because Dr. Walla destroyed her notes so we don't have them all right so she also said Alan has a sensory deprivation because the lights are on all the time and he was not sleeping I've been saying this since the day we found out that the lights are being kept on this is a tactic people in militaries use to torture their victims their, of war, to, to deprive them of sleep, to overload their sensory sensories so they have a sensory deprivation because if the light's on all the time, you're not getting your circadian rhythm sleep that we all need. It's proven science that we need sleep, and the darker it is, the better. Because we lose uh, 
can't remember. I've done so much looking into this. I can't remember what it is. Uh, there's some vitamins you lose, I think, and it's more it's but it's more beneficial if you are in a darkened room because all light can still seep in as you're sleeping. Um, something along those lines. All right. So during cross examination, Deputy Prosecutor Stacy Diener insinuated that Dr. Westcott received information about the defense attorney's opinion, and Dr. Westcott says no. So Stacy Diener, the prosecutor, is like, uh, so the defense attorney's told you what to say here, huh? And she was like, no. <laughs> like, I'm I'm an expert. I'm not, you know, my expertise isn't bought and paid for. I mean, I have fees, but you can't sell me on what I'm trying to say here. All right, so what else? Diener also pointed out that the prison psychologist and psychiatrist had more real-time interaction with Alan, so they'd be better suited to make a call on his health. Westcott said her job was to look at the mental health and documenting symptoms when asked why she chose to summarize some confessions and not others. The jury asked several questions about Alan faking and Westcott's testing methods. So some of the questions, um, I don't think we have any questions, but uh, some of them were along the lines of, you know, could, could anxiety and depression as a child lead to doing crimes in the future, which is like, no, duh, but okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the answer was. Hopefully we get some more clarification on those questions sometime soon because um, that would be interesting to see what they had to say. All right, so after that, the defense attorney's assistant, Max Baker, was back on the stand. Videos from inside Allen's prison cell were shown. So on Saturday, day 14, they were they watched videos from his cell and being moved from his cell to other areas like going to get a shower and things like that and it was very we'll say inhumane and one of the things that the jury did see which got leaked because one of the reporters could see the screen the screen had been angled away from the gallery so people couldn't see it but apparently a couple of the reporters saw it and they said that alan was sitting in a wheelchair strapped to a wheelchair in a cell with a, a black spit hood over his face. Spit hoods, apparently, when a prisoner spits or whatever, you put the spit hood on their face. Well, you're really not supposed to leave it on their face for very long, and, you know, they're, they're very controversial. But anyways, that is what they saw. So there's that. On day 15, they actually saw video. It's been reported. They they didn't get to see it, but they, you know, it was referred to in court. They saw a video of him slamming his head on the wall repeatedly. We've heard reports of that. And also covering himself in feces and eating his own feces. So I don't think anybody would do that in a normal right mind without some kind of mental health crisis, in my opinion. I don't care how bad you want to get out of prison. <laughs> I don't think you're going to fake it that bad by eating your own feces. All right, so videos from inside Allen's prison cell were shown. Again, the screen was turned so nobody from the public could see the videos. There was some later testimony that indicated they showed Allen eating his own feces and hanging, banging his head on the wall. Some jurors had shown noticeable reactions like looking away from the video, but most sat stone-faced and watched. I heard that one of the elderly, or one of the um, older gentlemen on the jury, when they were watching, like grabbed his head and went like, like this and like shook it. So, and, and like didn't want to look up again. Like he was, he was. It was painful. It was difficult to watch. You could tell. All right. So he said the defense was only trying to get sympathy from the jury. McLeland, 
Oh, wait, did I? Oh, there was te a test cross-examination by McLeland. He said the defense was only trying to get sympathy from the jury. He then asked Baker if they were trying to make Allen out to be the victim. At that point, Rosie objected, and both attorneys began speaking over one another. Judge Gull had to stop them. McLeland asked why they didn't show more videos where Alan was just sitting around and being normal. Baker, who is back on the stand, uh, the Max Baker is back on the stand. <coughs> He's the legal assistant, excuse me. He's the legal assistant to Rosie, I believe. Um, but but he's he's assisting the the team altogether, and he went through hours and hours and hours of video and compiled specific video to show the jury, and that's these were the videos that he chose: the feces video and the um whatever him hitting his head being dragged out of his cell and showered forcibly giving giving them force giving him involuntary forcible injections of a halidol these are the things that the jury's been seeing and max baker is responsible for compiling and editing down the pieces that um not editing them but you know taking them and putting them into watchable portions let's say all right, so uh, Baker responded, as far as I can tell you, Mr. McLeland didn't want the jury to see these videos either because McLeland asks, why you didn't show more video? Baker says, as far as I know, you didn't want the jury to see this video, these videos. And I heard that he just kind of snickered McLeland and didn't know what to say because Max Baker pushed back and it was probably a very beautiful moment in the trial and I would have loved to have seen it on video but unfortunately we won't maybe we'll get the audio but who knows I know Andrea Burkhart is working on that all right so Baker is referencing the fact that the prosecution objected to all the videos being shown so yes the prosecution said they didn't want any of those videos coming in the ones that they did allow in he's like well you're only showing them in his but in the worst light right like dude do you see what he's doing even if this is the only time he does it he's having a severe psychosis he's experiencing a severe mental health disorder right now and it's very clear to the observers but yet he's being tortured and the things that the prison guards are doing to him like putting him in a wheelchair and putting the thing over his face i'm absolutely 100 percent guarantee i'm not a therapist but i can guarantee you that's going to exacerbate his symptoms of feeling isolated feeling alone feeling this sense of he needs people around so he's going to feel even worse and that's going to give him more anxiety more depression all you're doing is making his symptoms worse and putting him into that state of psychosis. They are responsible for it. And they don't want anybody to know. And that's why they've been trying so desperately to keep this trial secret. But we're not going to let them. So we're going to keep reporting on it. And that's just that. All right, so court resumes at 1.30. This was his wrap-up. Unclear who our witnesses will be for the rest of the day. Could possibly be Richard Allen's wife since she was not here in the courtroom all day. Updates later. His wife was not ever called because I think they were planning on it, but I don't think they had time. So here is Max Lewis's wrap-up. Started after lunch with Richard Allen's half-sister, Janie Jones. The defense attorney, Jennifer Auger, asked if Alan ever molested her. She said no. She was asked if she loved him. She said yes. Auger then asked if she would lie for him for, you know, on the stand. She said no. Up next was Richard Allen's daughter, Brittany. So Brittany was called to the stand. Um, <clears throat> this, before I read... There was a big old confusion. Somebody, one of the pool reporters, 
wrote down his notes in a confusing way or misstated something in his notes. So it was later redacted, but I just want to tell you his answers to these were the exact opposite of what they were. So you can imagine that it was very, um, it would have been very bad if uh, that wasn't corrected right away. So here's, here's the questions. All right. So Ajay um, continues asking if she would ever lie. She says no. On cross-examination, uh, they bring where oh for Brittany again sorry I thought I read that okay so Ajay apologized before asking Brittany if her father ever molested her she said no Ajay asked her then if her if she loved her dad she said yes so these are the two questions that the reporter got wrong or inversed or whatever and obviously that would have been bad being reported out there I know he tweeted it or some people tweeted it, but then it had to be retracted. So anyways, it is confirmed by people that were in the room. She absolutely said, no, he never molested her. And yes, she loves him. And she looked at him when she said that. She was asked if she would lie for her dad. She said no. On cross-examination, Deputy Prosecutor James Luttrell asked if she and her father would go to the trails often, Ajay objected and it was sustained. Brittany said she and her dad maybe crossed the bridge once or twice. If it was sustained, why is she answering it? I don't know. Uh, the questions about molesting them are clearly the defense's attempt to show that just because Alan confessed to things doesn't mean that they were true because we know that he admitted or confessed to Dr. Walla that he molested his sister and his daughter. They both confirmed on the stand that didn't happen. He also said he took the lives of his family, including his daughter, his, his wife, I think, um, his parents or something, maybe his sister. I don't know. He was, he was basically taking the blame for everybody who is still very much alive. So, um, yeah, I don't know how you can trust any of those confessions. Brittany said her and her dad crossed the bridge once or twice. The questions about molesting them are clearly, um, I read that. Sorry. They're clearly to show that he, he's not, his confessions aren't, they, they're not reliable and they shouldn't be trusted. So up next on the stand was a Shelby Hicks. She was on the bridge the day of the homicides and was seen by Cheyenne Mill, who testified last week. She got to the trails around 2.30 and walked around before sitting on the bridge with her then-boyfriend. She didn't hear or see anything suspicious, so she's on the bridge at 2.30 with her boyfriend, didn't see or hear anybody. Interesting. Next up was Steve Millen, who is the prosecutor's investigator. Defense attorney Andrew Baldwin had a large packet and started to ask Mullen if he checked how many Ford Focus hatchbacks there are in Carroll County and its surrounding counties. And now remember, this is like the third time I think Mullen has been on the stand. He was called by the prosecution and then... Um, the, for the first time he did his full testimony and then he was called again by the prosecution because the jury had a question about how many Ford Focuses were there in the area and he didn't have an answer for that. So he went back, did a little research and came in and testified again for the prosecution and said Richard Allen's was the only make, the only one that was of this make and model Anywhere in the county, there were eight other cars, but they weren't the same make or model or whatever. They weren't the same mo model. Um, he had a Ford Focus and I think a hatchback Ford Focus. And um, we couldn't even see or, or definitively determine that that was his car in the security footage that they're claiming it was his. Um, but yet, we're arresting him on that. 
So anyways, um, so Steve Mullen is now back on the stand called by the defense. The defense attorney, Andrew Baldwin, had a large packet, asked him if he checked how many Ford Focuses there are in the counties. He said it appears there were quite a few. The list wasn't certified, so defense couldn't present it. Oh, man. Baldwin then asked Mullen about all the missing interviews. So, well, first, let's back up. So, Andrew Baldwin had this list of quite a few Ford Focuses in the area, yet Mullen reported, testified on the stand that there was only the one. Only the one like his, which I find highly unlikely. Oh boy, we've got some sirens going on this morning. Hold on. All right, I think it's finally done. Um, I don't know what I was saying, but they impeached Steve Mullen, Officer Mullen, on the stand because of the Ford focuses. There were quite a few, unfortunately. Whoops, I didn't mean to click on that. Unfortunately, they couldn't present the list as evidence, though. That's the problem. But moving on, they've come with they've come to so many roadblocks with this stinking judge and everything that it's so frustrating when they don't have the opportunity to present their evidence that they have. Hold on again, one second. All right, so, um, yeah, unfortunately, they couldn't show that list. Um, so Mullen, a Baldwin asked Mullen about the missing interviews. Mullen said he cataloged all the interviews and went that went missing. Baldwin then pointed out that Mullen testified that he didn't during a previous hearing. Um, that he hadn't. So he testified that he hadn't cataloged them. Baldwin then asked if Mullen was aware of dozens of references to a white van on social media. He then again brought up Dr. Walla, Allen's prison psychologist, who was reading online groups and discussing with them. There was actually a photo that's swirling around there on X of a comment from uh Dr. or no, that Grace Hughes guy who Dr. Wallace said that she listened to. So maybe she was talking to him, but she, um, Dr. Walla was talking about the Gray Hughes, and Gray Hughes actually made a comment about a van online in March of 2023. So that's, that's not like the, the one smoking gun that the prosecution is saying it is because that's their case now is that he knew something that only the perpetrator would know and that was the the white van was there at whatever time that's the reason why he's arrested apparently they keep changing their story so anyways all right so baldwin then asked if mullen was aware of dozens of references to a white van he then again brought up dr walla reading the online groups. Mullen admitted that he doesn't know what Dr. Wallace said to Alan. During cross, Mullen said the first time he had heard of a van was after the confession. Last up for the day was Brad Weber, who drives a white van and lives near Highbridge. And he lives right by that access road that the defense has hinted might have been a transportation way to get the girls in a car or out of there somewhere but you also have brad weber's whole property and you have ron logan who the property where the girls are found do they know one another their neighbors were they both involved it's just there's so many potential suspects that could have been looked at that weren't and it's so aggravating Baldwin again hits them with a statement he gave to an FBI agent where he said that he went and worked on the ATM machines and didn't go straight home. So he testified when he was Brad Weber, this is the second time he's on the stand too, he testified for the prosecution and said that he went straight home. But that is not what he said to an FBI agent. He said he, he before he came home from work, he stopped to work on some ATM machines. 
Weber testified last week that he left work at 2.02 and would have arrived home around 2.30. That lines up with the prosecution's timeline. Baldwin indicated that Weber originally told police he drove his Subaru to work that day and not his van. Uh, oh, so he wasn't... Uh, According to the police that he talked to, he wasn't even in his van. He was in a different car. Very interesting. All right, so Baldwin then asked him. Can you stop, please? Everything keeps flickering. Baldwin then asked him when the last time he was. Keeps flickering. Hold on. Okay, I think we're good. The cord, the connector, it's like so particular and if something bumps it even the slightest like another cord bumps it it goes out all right so that lines up with the prosecution's timeline baldwin indicated that weber originally took police told police he drove his subaru not his van baldwin then asked him the last time he was on the side of the creek where the girls were eventually found and he said that and he said that summer this summer asked him when the last time was he was on that side of the creek he said it was that summer this summer this summer so the summer of 2024 was the last time brad weber was on the side of the creek where the girls were found baldwin then admitted a picture of weber's garage and branches in it i assume it's to make the tie to the branches at the scene didn't really get into it too much but this was something that Nick objected to. Gull allowed it in, and then uh, I don't think she knew what she was letting in because there were branches in there that were cut and might be in similar fashion as uh, the branches at the scene, potentially, from what we're hearing. So during cross, Weber said that cops searched his home, his car, and he was given a lie detector test at one point. McLeland point well what was the result? McLeland pointed out that when Weber spoke with police a few days after the homicides, he said he left work at 202 and was driving his van. During redirect, Baldwin asked if he said something different to the FBI agents. Weber said yes, according to you. That was the last of the witnesses today. Court picks up at 9 a.m. All right, so let's that was Good recap. They give us so many details. This one's going to be another lengthy one. So sorry, but let's dive in. So this is Wish TV, Kyla, uh, News 8's Kyla Russell, according to her. So Richard Allen entered the courtroom Monday morning wearing a blue striped button down shirt. There's an ad. Hold on. Sorry about that. I know you guys didn't hear it, but it was driving me crazy. The um, There was like an embedded video in this document, or in this page, rather, that just started playing randomly without me telling it to, and it was blasting my eardrums, and um, yeah, I paused it now, so sorry. <laughs> okay, back to it. Uh, Delphi Homicides Day 15 Live Blog. Where were we? I gotta scroll all the way down to the bottom because that's where we start and go up. All right. So, nope. Sorry. All right. So Alan, he was wearing a blue striped button-down shirt and khakis. He was carrying a Bible. He apparently showed defense attorney Andrew Baldwin a verse when sitting with him. Special Judge Fran Gall and the jury entered shortly after 9 a.m., and the defense called their first witness, Dr. Polly Westcott. Westcott is a neuropsychologist based in Carmel. She told the court her specialty was in forensic psychology and neuropsychology. Baldwin and defense attorney Rosie, Brad Rosie, hired Westcott in May 2023 to assess Allen's mental, emotional, and physical health decline while he was in Westville. Westcott was given access to Allen's mental health treatment records, video footage from the prison, and access to his recorded calls. 
She told the jury she received more information about Allen than she had in other criminal in any other criminal case that she's worked before. Russell noted that Westcott stopped receiving videos of Allen in March of 2024. So she evaluated about a year's worth of stuff, at least, if that's what they're saying, that she's no longer, or she stopped receiving in March, but she started receiving in May of 2023, so almost a year's worth. All right, so she met with Allen at Westville in August 2023 and performed the assessment over two days. Westcott said she also spoke with his wife, Kathy, for additional information on Richard, on Richard Allen. Her report in total ended up being 127 pages. Through her assessment, she said she learned Allen had an extensive mental health record, saying he had severe anxiety through his childhood before starting anxiety medication in his 20s. She said Allen also struggled with depression, fears of failure, and self-deletion ideation through young adult and adulthood. That's sad. Um, and now he's all alone and isolated and what they did to him, he's never going to be the same. We also learned from Alan that his wife played a crucial role in putting him back together. Oh boy. Uh, so she also assessed Alan for a personality disorder and determined he had dependent personality disorder, which is a type of anxious personality disorder that leaves the patient feeling helpless, unable to make decisions, and incapable of taking care of themselves. Westcott said Alan relied on his wife, mother, and family for support to feel like a whole person. Westcott came to six conclusions in her assessment. Alan has a long history of mental health issues. Alan was not faking or exaggerating his symptoms. Alan is slower to understand, process, and respond to things. Alan experienced a complete mental health decrease in Westville. I'm going to repeat that. He experienced a complete mental health decrease in Westville because of the torturous things that they did to him. Alan has major depressive disorder and slipped into psychosis due to stress. Alan's brain chemistry was changed while in prison due to no contact with his wife and his family. Rosie handed Westcott Alan's writing samples so that she previously reviewed, including a letter he wrote asking for assistance from the court in November 2022 and a letter he wrote to Kathy before incarceration. Prosecution objected to admitting the handwritten letters, calling them hearsay. Judge Gull requested a sidebar and later admitted the writing samples after redacting a few words. Rosie then asked for Westcott to evaluate the handwriting, not the word in the samples. So not the words, just the handwriting itself. Westcott said the November 2022 sample was organized and well thought out, but the letter structure from the letter sample, the later sample, which is the confession, was completely different and fragmented. After reviewing the samples, Westcott continued discussing her evaluations of Richard Allen. She said she gave him a MCI or mild cognitive impairment test which is a comprehensive test for personality features and mental health disorders. The test also evaluated if, a if Allen was faking his symptoms. The state objected again, saying they asked for a copy of these results but did not receive them. Rosie explained they could not only be given to a mental health professional and they could they could only be given to a mental health professional and that the state did not even take the time to take a deposition of Westcott. Wow. But then they're going to cry and complain that her info can't come in. After back and forth between the defense, the state and Judge Gull, Westcott reiterated that she did not believe Alan was faking his mental illness. Excuse me. In total... <laughs> Sorry. In total, Westcott administered 50 tests on Allen, which came to the conclusion that Allen was not very resilient in the face of stress. 
She said he was prone to decompensation and could slip into psychosis, which was seen in his behavior from December 2022, so two months in already. Less than two months in, because it was like later in October. Uh, so December 22nd, 2022 to July 2023. She later said Alan's brain chemistry changed due to sensory deprivation during solitary confinement. Westcott also commented on Dr. Monica Walla's reports of Alan. Walla, who was Alan's psychologist at Westville, reported Alan's homicide confessions in like a story like manner, according to Westcott, but the videos of Alan at the same time weren't logical. So the things he was saying, the way he was wording things, the way he was talking about things, they didn't go in a sensical story-like manner. He would just be random and disorganized, I'm assuming. So that would lead Westcott to believe that this so-called narrative story-like confession that we got from Dr. Walla is probably fabricated. She said Alan's brain was like a fun house during solitary confinement and admitted she was worried that he had delirium. Yeah, that's bad. Prosecution Deputy Stacy Diener began her cross-examination by stating Walla visited Alan every day, so he was not completely deprived of social interaction. She then, yeah, but Walla would come for like a couple minutes and try to talk about the case with him. She was trying, she was fishing for information and probably telling him, who knows, I believe she was working for the state or at least was more than willing to help the state with their case against him. She then asked if Westcott received all the DOC records, which Westcott said she believed she she believed she did, given that there was information from every day Alan was in Westville. Westcott told the jury at one point Alan said Satan K I double L the girls, and she felt he was making statements inconsistent with reality. She added that Alan didn't seem to know he was going to meet with him. She added that Alan didn't seem to know he was going to meet with him. Meet with who? That's not clear. Satan? I mean, <laughs> is he going to meet with Satan? Um, all right, so Diener asked if Alan's dependence could have been transferred to his wife, to Walla, to which Westcott said no, that Alan was only confiding in her. She said some of the videos she received of Alan weren't time stamped and added she took uh, bleh, can't say that word. She took self deletion companion notes a certain amount of weight to them in her overall assessment. So she didn't give she only gave a certain amount of weight to those companion notes. Westcott said people experiencing psychosis are not in the same reality as others, but can still say factual things. Diener commented that two of Allen's confessions weren't in Westcott's report and asked if she didn't find them significant. Westcott confirmed she did use those confessions and summarized them in her report. Diener ended her cross and the jury asked several questions about Allen's mental health history. Here are our questions. Okay, good. If Mr. Allen was, has the common sense to be afraid to leave his cell, would he have the common sense to fake his symptoms? Westcott said Allen's statement about being afraid was before his psychotic episode. So she's not relating the two or conflating the two because I think that's what this juror is doing. All right, if he was depressed as a child, would that cause him where am I, to cause him to commit crimes as an adult? Westcott said not always and that it depends on the personality type. Would depression as a child cause or become a sex cause someone to become a sex addict? Westcott said no. Did you watch Allen's police interview in October 2022? Westcott said yes. All right. 
I'm going to scroll up to the next section because they write it in backwards as the day goes on. Court returned from break at 1130. Judge Gull called for an immediate sidebar, noting the state's objection to viewing videos of Allen while in Westville. News 8's Kyla Russell said Kathy Allen was not has not been in the courtroom all morning, but Allen's daughter was seated outside the courtroom. His daughter has not been present throughout the trial. She probably doesn't want to hear or see her dad going through this. After the jury entered, the defense recalled intern Max Baker to set up videos. Again, this is the the, the attorney assistant uh, for Rosie, I believe. He said the camera, the security camera video from inside Allen's cell does have timestamps. The courtroom TV again was turned away. The, it was facing away from the gallery, only visible to the jury, Judge Gall, and the witness stand. Baker told the jury he created the video by piecing together smaller parts of the cell footage. Video one was from April 12, 2023, and included clips. From a five-hour time frame, video two included clips taken from May 25th, 2023, over a 12-hour time period. Russell noted video one. Who's Russell? Who the heck is Russell? I think they need to proof this before they post it. Who is Russell? Russell noted video one was an hour, 20 minute long, and that multiple jurors took notes while watching it. An alternate juror, oh, Russell, Kyla Russell, sorry. I was thinking it was someone in the case. No, Kyla Russell, our reporter here, she says that uh, an alternate juror who said, uh, who Russell said has a high school age daughter raised her eyebrow throughout the one hour and 20 minute video state prosecutors and the defense gathered around the tv to watch richard allen did not watch the footage video number two was 26 minutes long defense attorney brad rosie said while watching the video many jurors glanced at allen after the video ended rosie continued questioning baker baker said he looked through 18 to 20 hours of footage between april and July 2023. State prosecutor Nick McLeland spoke up asking if it was better for Allen to be in his cell alone. Rosie objected, stating Baker couldn't decide that. Gull sustained the objection. That's good because he's not an expert there. McLeland then asked why Baker chose the camcorder videos shown on Saturday. Few of the camcorder videos included Allen being tased, showering, eating feces, receiving an x-ray, and interacting with his nurse. But there's been no sound, so you don't hear anything. Baker said he picked the videos he did because they showed Rick's life in prison. McLeland commented that Baker showed that he viewed, or he only showed what he viewed as his worst condition in Westville, and Baker said he showed the jury the video to try to show that Richard Allen is the victim. That's what McLeland said, that Baker only showed these videos to portray Allen as a victim. A back and forth ensued between McLeland, Rosie, and Baker. McLeland ended his questioning, and Rosie jumped in to ask, you picked what you picked, what you picked to show them the truth? Baker said yes. Russell said many objections were raised. Baker became snippy at one point. Soon after, the jury asked if the attorney, see, like, why did they say Baker became snippy at one point? We didn't hear that. And what was his, what was he snippy about? Like, tell us, don't just say, well, the witness got snippy at McLeland. Like, tell us why. There's probably a reason. McLeland was probably being a douche. Sorry. You're, excuse me. Sorry for my language. Um, But he was probably being a douche. And that might have, she might have been referencing when Baker clapped back about the whole, well, you, from what I know, you didn't want any of these videos shown. So that's probably what the snippiness was, but they should explain that and not just say witness became snippy. 
Soon after, the jury asked if the attorneys asked Baker to choose the worst videos. I had my own discretion, Baker said. Court recessed for lunch. Like, okay, really chose the worst videos. Well, yeah, of course you're going to choose, like, some of the worst examples because you want the jury to see what his actual conditions were like. That is the truth. So you're going to show that. And the other moments where he's just sitting there lying around and doing nothing, you probably don't want to watch for very long because it's boring. So you're going to show like instances where he's doing something in his cell. And in this case, he's smacking his head on the wall or eating his feces. So I just, I don't get this prosecutor or this judge. All right, so we're back from lunch now. At 1.34 p.m., Judge Fran Gall has entered the courtroom and court was back in session without the jury. She says that the report from Westcott fits into totem pole hearsay, meaning it's probably hearsay upon hearsay, maybe even upon hearsay. <laughs> so the expert, uh, or she explains that unless the state can cite specific hearsay, she will admit it. The jury is back in the courtroom at 1.37 p.m. Defense attorney Jennifer Auger calls Jamie Jones, Richard Allen's half-sister. She tells the jury that Allen is five years older than her and that they lived together all through childhood. She says Allen got married right after getting back from being in the military. Jones tells the jury that Allen did not ever molest her or touch her inappropriately. Ajay asks her, do you love your brother? Jones responds, yes. Ajay asks, would you lie for him? Jones says, no. Ajay concludes her direct examination. Uh, Prosecutor James Luttrell begins his cross-examination. He asks Jones, does the name Chris ring a bell? Ajay objects as they were discussing neighborhood kids while Alan and Jones were growing up. The objection is sustained and Luttrell moves on. Why are their childhood friends? What does that have to do with anything? The defense called Brittany Z- Zapanta, Richard Allen's daughter. Alan is reportedly nodding his head as he takes the stand. As she takes the stand. So he's nodding his head as she takes the stand. Zapanta tells the jury that she moved out in 2014 for a job. She says she worked in urgent care. She attended Ball State and then went to Indianapolis. Ajay says, did your father molest you? Zapanta says, no. Ajay asks, would you lie for him? Zapanta says, no. The defense finishes direct examination of her. The trial begins his direct examination. He asks Zapanta, Did you and your father go to the trail a lot? And did you and your father go on Moan and High Bridge? Ajay objects to both questions. The first objection is sustained. The final was overruled. She then said that she went to the bridge with her dad and only crossed it once or twice. Luttrell asks Zampanta if Alan changed his appearance after she left for Ball State. She says no. He asks another question about Alan's height and weight. Ajay objects. He shows Zampata photos of Alan. Ajay asks to approach the bench. News 8's Kyla Russell notes that Alan is smiling at Zampata, but she does not make eye contact with him. After the sidebar ends, Luttrell says, or shows Zampata more photos and asks if certain photos like, look like her dad in February 2017. She says, yes, the gallery did not see the photos. Auger objects and says the photos are outside the scope of questioning and there is another sidebar. Judge Gull sustains the objections. At 1.56 p.m., the jury asks questions to Zimpata. She tells the jury she visited the bridge in her teens and crossed the high bridge with her dad and only crossed it once or two times. Alan is seen smiling at as Zampanta leaves. All right, up next. At 1.56 p.m., the defense calls Shelby. Shelby? Shelby? You guys remember Magnolia, uh, Steel Magnolias? Shelly? 
Um, at 1.56 p.m., the defense calls Shelby Hicks. Hicks says she is a realtor and was 29 years old in 2017. She tells the jury on February 13th, 2017, that she took her car in for repair and went for a hike with her boyfriend. She says they got to the trails around 2.30 and parked in connector lot. In connector lot or in a connecting lot? I don't know. Defense attorney Andrew Baldwin is trying to get her to say Mir's entrance. Okay, so the Mir's entrance she entered. Baldwin asks her if there was anyone parked there other than her. She says there were other cars. Hicks says they walked toward the highway for five minutes and then went toward the high bridge. She tells the jury it takes 10 to 15 minutes to get to the bridge. She said they saw an older gentleman two girls from school, and a few other kids. At this point, what time is it? 2.30? We've got all these people around. And yet no one saw Libby and Abby, apparently. Hicks says she saw an older gentleman um, with a camera and saw Cheyenne and Shelby Duncan from school. She tells the jury she was their first on the bridge's platform. She says she said hi to her friends from high school. Hicks tells the jury she was on the platform for 15 to 20 minutes and went back to her car with her boyfriend. She tells the jury she does not remember if other cars were there when she left. Hicks says the next day her boyfriend Daniel wanted to tell law enforcement what they had seen. She says they went to police but were asked to come back at another time. And they went back that evening. Hicks tells the jury she did not hear anything on the bridge. She says she met with law enforcement twice, first on February 14th and then again in March of 2017. She says the police never took her phone to extract data. At 2.23 p.m., prosecution attorney Stacy Diener begins her cross-examination Hicks says her cellular provider in 2017 was Sprint. She tells the jury she's never walked across the high bridge. She says on that day, she left the platform before her friends returned. The jury asks questions. Was the man with the camera old? Hicks says yes. Did you arrive at the bridge at 2.55? Hicks says could have been. At 2.29 p.m., the defense calls. Steve Mullen. The defense call shows Mullen a list of Ford Focus SEs in white registered in Cass, Carroll, and Tippanoo. Tip, blah, blah, blah. Let me try that again. The defense shows Mullen a list of Ford Focus SEs in white registered in Cass, Carroll, and Tippecanoe counties between 2011 and 2017. Baldwin says he only focused on cars that were similar to Allen's. Okay. Prosecutor McLean objects to the exhibit saying it was not certified. So, uh, and then it's not, it, it, the list doesn't come in, which is a shame. Baldwin asks how many people owned similar hatchback models in Carroll County or surrounding areas in 2017, and Mullen says he does not know. There you have it. Baldwin says Mullen created a log of missing interviews. He says on March 18th that Mullins did not say that he did not say that he created this log at his deposition or at the hearing, sorry, at the hearings in March that we had for the for there were hearings that took place um back in March trying to uh get um the attorneys for misconduct and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Mullen, I believe, testified during that hearing. So uh, Baldwin raises his voice, then apologizes to the judge. Yeah, you don't want to piss off Gall and raise your voice at her if you're mad at Nick Le Mick Leland. You <laughs> don't misplace your anger on Gall because she'll put it right back on you. Ten times worse. Mullen looks at the transcript from the March hearing. He admits 
that at the time there was no log. He tells the jury that there is a log in the filing cabinets from early on and says he has gone through the cabinet and found it since he testified in March. So there was no log or there was a log, but you didn't know it and then you found it. Those are like two different things. That's confusing. Baldwin then asked about Libby's phone. McLean asks for a sidebar. Why? Why can't we talk about Libby's phone? Baldwin says Dr. Walla was a fan of Delphi sites. Yes, and asks if it would be important to find out if a van was discussed on social media. Mullen says he did not look. So he didn't investigate if there were had been any talk about vans in anywhere you're just going off the fact that you hadn't heard about the van theory so the van theory is the only thing the perpetrator would know even though it's been rolling around in social media for months years baldwin says there were many mentions of a van on social media he says mullen doesn't know what Walla said when she was taking care of Alan. At 2.45, the jury asks questions of Mullen. Question is, why would anyone discuss a van prior to Alan's confession? Mullen says, that's why we looked into this. That was the first we heard of it. So just because it's the first time you heard of it doesn't mean that, that's, that that ties him to it. Ridiculous. Baldwin asks Mullen if they had ever heard of a van, a white van 30 minutes outside of Delphi with a suspicious thin man asking kids if they wanted candy. Mullen says he does not recall. That's interesting. I want to know more about that van. All right. I think this is, yeah, this is the last one. All right. So testimony from Brad Weber. At 2.48 p.m., the defense calls Brad Weber. The reporter notes Weber seems extremely disheveled. What? Why would you come to court extremely disheveled? Like, I picture him, his hair all over, his outfit all, like, half tucked in, all wrinkled, not buttoned right. He's missing a button and skipped a button. <laughs> like, that's what I think when I think disheveled and looking like he, you know, five o'clock shadow like he'd been drinking all night that's what i'm picturing i don't even know what this guy looks like that's that's what i'm picturing <clears throat> we'll go with that right <laughs> all right so baldwin asks him why he was upset when they talked before because last time weber was on the stand and all andrew baldwin was doing the questioning and brad yelled at him that loud and lippy with Brad I mean with Baldwin <clears throat> hold on I really need to clear my throat and take a drink okay sorry uh, so Baldwin asks him why he was upset when they talked before Weber says I was upset because you were trying to tell me what I did when I got off work Baldwin handed him a script from an FBI interview Weber did in 2017 Weber tells the jury he went on a three-day trip to Arizona and got back the Sunday before the girls' lives were taken. Baldwin asks him about his ATM machine business. Weber says he makes money off them through surcharges. He doesn't know how many he had in 2017. He says he had 30 at one point and has 15 now. Weber tells the jury he attended to his ATM machines daily, says he checks how much money they have and gets money from the bank. He says he doesn't know what bank he used in 2017. He thinks it was Regions Bank. Weber says his ATMs are at gas stations, taverns, restaurants. He said he used a black Subaru to drive to service his ATMs. He says he uses Regions Bank now, but not always the same branch. He says on the day of the homicides that he went straight home from his other job at the Subaru plant. Weber tells the jury that nobody from law enforcement asked him to go to the police station this past August, that they asked him to go to a different location. 
He says, it could have been Steve Mullen that called. He says, only time I used my van was when I was pulling a trailer. Hmm. So, did he have a trailer? Or was he just driving his van? It, which, in, case, in that case, then he was lying here. I don't know. This guy is very inconsistent. I don't trust him. Weber says he took a nap when he got home after work on February 13th, got up around 5 p.m. when someone knocked on the door. Baldwin asks, do trespassers come on your property? Weber says yes. Weber says he did not hear any screaming on that day. He says he had a home in Lafayette in 2017 and owns a trailer. Weber tells the jury he gave law enforcement permission to go inside his house, but it was not on February 13th. He says his van was in the grass and the Subaru was in the driveway. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Baldwin hands him a photo of his garage from February 19, 2017. McLeland objects to the photo. Judge Gull admits the photo. McLeland calls for a sidebar. At 3.20 p.m., McLeland began his cross-examination. Weber says law enforcement stopped him on his way home a few times, probably on February 17th. He says someone looked through his property on the 13th. He confirms he talked to law enforcement on the 17th. He said he went straight home from work on March or on February 13th. At 3.26 p.m., the jury asked Weber these questions. And we don't have answers, do we? Oh, we have some answers, yes. They're just not, they're not highlighted. So, yes, we have answers. Number one, do you know if the ATMs would have photo or video of servicing? Weber says, not the actual ATMs, but some of the locations. So, would we be able to prove or disprove him tending to those ATMs? Number two, how far in advance would you have to order cash for ATMs? And Weber says getting cash isn't a problem, but a week in advance. Number three, what is the process to clock out of work? Weber says it's a turnstile. That's not clocking out of work. <laughs> a turnstile is those things that you turn to have to get out the door. That's not clocking out of work. I don't think he knows what that means. Um, unless there's a type of clock that's a turnstile that I'm not aware of or called something like a turnstile. Anyways, number four, what driveway do you use at home? Weber says driveway under the Monon High Bridge. Five, do you drive under the bridge? Would you have taken that route on February 13th? Weber says yes. Number six, do you typically go home before servicing your ATMs? Weber says no. So that's not a typical thing for him to just go straight home. So why this day did he just go straight home? Or tell whoever, the police, that he went straight home? The defense says they have no more questions for today. And the jury has left for the afternoon. They say they had planned to have former state trooper Kevin Murphy testify. He is one of the individual troopers who was looking into the Odinist angle. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, learning what his, how they're going to kind of get around the third party Odinist stuff while having him testify. Because he was part of the investigation so i'm sure he's got some good info that he can provide all right um so kevin murphy was supposed to testify and that he would have said the that incident command always said there were do you mean unified command the unified command always said there were more than one person involved in the investigation the prosecution objected to the testimony of course they did so they're calling Kevin Murphy to testify that Unified Command has always known that there has been more than one person involved, and that's what they've been looking for more than one person. And then the prosecution objects. That how is that even objectionable? Like it infuriates me that he even has the balls to say I object to that. 
I mean, it's ridiculous. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Like he has tried everything to get his way in this trial. And Judge Gull, unfortunately, gives him his way a lot. So after the jury has left the courtroom, Baldwin says he has an offer of proof for third-party suspects. He says, if Alan had asked police if my spit was on one of the girls, Judge Gull tells the defense, we've had this discussion a thousand times. You have no evidence to tie these people to the crime. Baldwin says, I believe there is more than an excess. And that's how the day ended. Ooh, with a little tension between Baldwin and Gull. That is... How it ends. All right, so there you have it, folks. We have completed a, our summary of day 15. Be sure to hit the like button on your way out of here, please. And also make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss all of the summaries that we're going to be providing for the rest of the Richard Allen trial. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Take care, guys. Bye.